ACIGS webinar series today on Thursday, the 25th of November, 2021. My name is Ryan Hackney and I'm the current secretary of ACIGS and I'll be hosting webinar number 26. A quick background on the society. Um, ACIGS is the Australasian chapter of the International Geosynthetic Society. It's been established for 20 years as of 2022. And we are one of the 45 chapters globally, which combined have over 4,000 individual members, over 5,000 students, and that includes uh, more than 190 corporate members. The Australasian chapter covers the interests of Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. By becoming a member of ACIGS, you are also becoming a member of the IGS. And there are many resources avail available directly on the IGS website, including educational documents, um, lecture series videos. There's a huge library of IGS proceedings. And of course, there's the free access to the technical journals such as Geotextiles and Geomembranes and Geosynthetics International. You can access the website at geosyntheticsociety.org or you can use the QR code that we've placed there in the bottom right hand side of the screen. If you check out the ACIGS website, again, we've got many resources available, including a dedicated student section, um, uh, students of which are free to join. Um, we've got current news, upcoming events, information on how to become either a individual or company member, and of course, our own resources. The uh, resources include the previous webinars that we've recorded to date, plus the other events that we have recorded, such as our seminar series and our forum debates that we introduced this year in 2021. There's some fan fantastic content, so if you've missed any of the webinars, be sure to go to ASIGS.org to check them out. If you would like a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, please email info at acigs.org uh, with your details and we can organize a certificate for you. Um, here's just a quick plug for our inaugural Geosynthetics Conference, Geo ANZ number one. Um, we'll, be, we'll be holding this at the Brisbane Convention Exhibition Centre between 7th and 9th of June in 2022. The registrations for this event and call for abstracts is now open, uh, so please keep an eye out for any upcoming announcements as well regarding the, uh, the content and upcoming speakers. Moving on to today's webinar, firstly we would like to thank the sponsor for this event, who are Fabtech, so many thanks for supporting the ACIGS webinar series. Today's webinar is uh, geosynthetics in gas, gas harvesting and renewable energy. And this will be presented by Graham Fairhead. A quick bio on Graham. Graham is a qualified engineer and he has held executive positions in manufacturing, design, engineering, sales and marketing, and general management internationally across Europe, America, and Australia. Having joined Fabtech as its man managing director in 2007, Graham has led the development and growth of Fabtech to become Australia's leading geosynthetics installation company. Graham also leads the technical group within Fabtech, who is focused on materials, barrier system design, and floating cover design. The foundations on the company's growth have remained consistent, being technical leadership, customer retention, safety, and quality. If you have any questions um, following today's webinar, if you could please use the Q&A section at the bottom rather than the chat box, we will then answer those at the end. So thank you and over to you, Graham. There we go. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so, so uh, today I'm going to talk um, uh, by way of um, background for the subject a little bit about renewable energy, uh, methane, and then move into anaerobic digestion, 
And then more particularly, uh, geosynthetic uh, design in our anaerobic reactors construction, and then um, some examples to illustrate those those features. Graham, can I just um, interrupt there? We, we can see a second screen with the uh, next slide to show. Maybe you could just um, switch the view so we can see the full screen. I don't, to, I don't know how to do that exactly. That'd be interesting. If not, it, um, we can just see the presentation screen at the moment. Yep, that'll work. Is that okay? Is that okay about that? Um, it's a bit small. Can you tell me what I need to do? Uh, I think you need to share uh, your other screen. So if you stop sharing this screen, And then you should maybe a bit maybe able to share the um, the presentation screen itself. There should be two options. What can you see now? Um, we can see the full PowerPoint. Maybe try click that resume slideshow box that's uh, on your top toolbar there. Where would that be, sorry? Uh, move your cursor up. It says like there, click on resume slideshow there. Sorry, let me, um, I think I'll try and do It's in the display settings menu where you can see the toggle screens. So when you look at the uh, share screen. Now I lost you as well. There you go. Let's get you back up again. No, nope, that's your emails. <laughs> well, let's try the game. Can you see that now? Uh, yes. What can you see now? Uh, we can just see the full PowerPoint. Maybe you just want to start from the, the first slide and, oh, well, yeah, we can see the uh, preview screen again, but let's let's carry on from. Okay, apologies for that, I'm not sure how to fix that. So, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to uh, why this is important, renewable energy, methane and anaerobic digestion, and, um, and then the design issues around and constructions around these facilities. So just firstly on um, uh, renewable energy, which is energy from sources that are naturally replenished. From the bottom right here, you can see that um, um, uh, around nearly 30% of Australia's uh, electricity generation is now from renewables. And on the right hand side, you can see that um, of that, it's dominated by wind and uh, solar, and bioenergy is only around 5%. But having said that, um, a recent report only this month actually uh, from Arena is saying that bioenergy could add 10 billion to uh, Australian GDP, create a lot of jobs, reduce. Uh, emissions by 9%, um, obviously very important. 
uh, reduce waste to landfill and, and other benefits. Specifically then thinking about methane reduction and most unprocessed waste breaks down with methane as a byproduct. And if you look at the, um, the bottom left, um, you can see that um, the, uh, this is the methane concentration in our atmosphere. In the last 15 years, a pretty steady trend of increasing methane concentration in the atmosphere, not decreasing, unfortunately. And in terms of the source, you can see the, see the top graph here. Uh, that's uh, by, by source of um, uh, methane uh, across different geographic regions. The, um, the orange is, the, is um, landfill and waste, and it's a relatively consistent story across all geographic re regions. A significant portion of methane is coming from landfills and waste. Now, methane is really important as a, as a topic because it's much more uh, powerful as a greenhouse gas damaging the environment than CO2, which gets most of the headline attention, is 20 times more um, damaging. And it accounts for 25% of global warming currently. At the recent COP26 conference, um, there was a, a pledge by um, a large number of countries to reduce methane emissions by 30% uh, over, um, over the next nine years. So the anaerobic uh, digestion process. So in, in the absence of oxygen, waste, organic waste can be decomposed um, and um, uh, produces as a, a primary um, uh, waste stream from that is, is uh, methane biogas and hence damaging for the, um, for the environment. Uh, most, most anaerobic uh, digestion systems comprise uh, some kind of tank storage um, with a geosynthetic membrane cover. Um, it, within that facility, um, uh, the biogas can be captured, it can't escape, and then it can be used. It used to be in years for, uh, uh, previously uh, flared to reduce um, uh, methane to CO2, which was beneficial, but not ideal. And, uh, and the, um, the beneficial reuse systems are now much more sophisticated then lower quantities of gas can be used beneficially in heating systems or um, as a fuel um, and so, so forth. Uh, on smaller facilities that are more easily manageable, um, the, the solid waste that um, comes out of that process is often extracted regularly uh, and provides quite a, a rich fertilizer. And also, also very often in um, um, gas, the, the smell, the odour from these facilities is not particularly um, pleasant and odour control is an important uh, side product, as is um, uh, inventory management and by sealing off um, a lagoon and making an anaerobic digester um, excludes um, rainwater inventory adding to the wastewater inventory flow. Um, so then on to, on to the, the, the main topic of interest, uh, geosynthetics in covered anaerobic lagoons, cows. Um, most cows, um, they're more efficient if they're deep, uh, get stratification in the, uh, in the water that's in them, uh, with a relatively narrow floor, uh, relatively steep sides. Um, and um, uh, uh, you, you almost always um, uh, have a, some kind of primary geomembrane um, to uh, stop seepage. Um, regulations um, and environmental um, desires are, with these facilities are changing and um, there's more concern now about separation of the geosynthetic lining system um, from the, the water table and any seepage getting into the water table. So notwithstanding the quality of the primary geomembranes pretty good these days, and most applications that we'd build would include um, an electronic uh, leak survey. Um, uh, more and more plants are interested in whether they should be looking at a double liner system or a composite liner system to uh, absolutely ensure there's, there's virtually nothing um, risking the groundwater. As with um, as in most geom geomembranes, uh, if the subgrade is not, um, not the best, uh, instead of um, spending money on the subgrade, sometimes it's more efficient, more efficient uh, to consider a cushion layer to protect the geomembrane. Um, 
and also um, in terms of those environmental regulations, some kind of leak detection system, usually um, a geosynthetic leak detection system, hydraulic system. Considering the sludge builder, sludge, sludge in these typical lagoons like this, or small, medium sized lagoon, um, maybe 10 years before sludge becomes a significant issue and it's necessary to go in often and, and uh, remove uh, sludge. Uh, and therefore, uh, a relatively durable membrane is necessary to resist the loads that are generated when desludging. So, good mechanical properties. Um, and in terms of uh, materials, uh, the example here is, uh, is um, polyethylene HDP, black HDP. Uh, that generally tends to be the material of choice for the line system. Um, Properties that are really important, chemical resistance. The, um, uh, the, the line system has to resist um, fogs, uh, fat oils and greases. Um, the, the chemistry of the waste stream, obviously, but also acids as well. It's usually an acid environment and you get a lot of um, hydrogen sulfide that becomes um, acid gas or acid liquid. Um, and so you need a line system that's um, tolerant of that. The lagoons run typically at 35, 40 degrees C, so running at elevated temperatures as well, um, which has an impact on the geomembrane life. Um, but no UV, there's no UV loading, obviously, because it's a covered, um, covered system. And, that, and those characteristics generally fit pretty well with the properties of HDP, really good chemical resistance, good, good temperature performance, um, and, and hence, uh, as an economic material, HDP generally is the um, preferred material. Um, the, um, the gym membranes need um, securing somewhere. So on the, on the crest, there's some kind of anchoring system. And also on the crest, you can see um, here uh, is some kind of gas main. We're producing gas. We've got to collect the gas and extract it from underneath the cover. So then this, this is an example of a gas ring main that's uh, going to collect all the gas and feed it to a discharge point where it can be extracted from the cover. And then adjacent to, to that, it typically is the anchoring system, which obviously needs to provide a good mechanical performance to secure the liner and the cover. A um, couple of options, this, this, this example again, this is a refurbishment, so replacing an existing lagoon cover. You can see a big concrete beam, uh, you can see the studs and the battening system is used to secure. Um, in this case, the line has gone underneath um, the beam and the uh, and the covers on top of the beam. Uh, alternatively, you can put both both onto the um, onto the beam and secure the battening. Importantly, because of that acid um, issue within the uh, the system, the concrete needs to be somehow uh, the design needs to consider that and make sure that the Concrete's going to survive in that acid environment. The, the alternative, of course, is um, an anchor trench, as this photo on the right hand side shows, um, which is uh, usually more economic um, than a concrete ring beam. Then, another benefit of the concrete beam is that uh, it does provide a restriction in terms of traffic accidentally getting onto the cover or um, also a debris blowing onto the cover, which is helpful. Whatever the anchoring system, it needs to um, uh, seal the liner and cover um, such that you don't get any gas leaks, any gas sealing in that system. The, uh, the cover designs are probably um, where, the, where the most interest is more difficult than um, just the line system design. So a couple of choices very early on. One, one is around whether the, um, the, the, the cover is gonna operate as a positive pressure or a negative pressure cover. So is the extraction system going to be keeping the, uh, the gas inside that system at, at negative pressure? That's usually the case. Usually negative pressure covers are, are most popular these days. And you can see the picture on the top, top left-hand corner here. Um, that's a negative pressure cover uh, operating. And you can see how neat and taut and flat uh, that cover looks in negative pressure. The illustration um, below, the picture below, is, um, is also a negative pressure cover, <clears throat> but that's, um, that's during commissioning, actually, and that's, um, the cover's required to provide some temporary um, gas storage 
in the event that the uh, the guest management system um, uh, has some issues offline uh, temporarily, um, rather than flare the gas, um, often uh, clients want the ability to temporarily store some gas until they can fix the issue with the, the gas system and then put it back um, back into negative pressure operation. So often they um, overpressure capability is required. Some facilities um, like to have, have in, intermittent draw off of the gas. So they have a gas inventory issue. Um, the gas um, production rates may fluctuate or, or, or the draw off fluctuates. And they want to use, have some ability to store rather than have, just dump the gas that they can't use. Um, not so common with uh, urban storage, it's more common uh, in tank systems with a flexible uh, lid on the tank, um, gas storage is, is used. Obviously, it rains on the cover, and you need to have um, some system for managing that. So you can see here there are uh, defined um, uh, troughs uh, to concentrate the water that falls on the cover uh, with uh, water extraction systems to take the um, the water off. Often a difficult, um, quite um, thoughtful design required. <clears throat> Scum builds up underneath the um, the cover and can and create um, uh, the surface of the cover bucket is not no longer flat and the water tends to pond and pool in places that aren't very helpful. That's quite a tricky area of design. Um, and also sampling and sludge extraction. You can also see in this bottom picture here on the, on the left, um, there's a sampling port. I'm trying to illustrate just there. Um, so the, um, the owner can just check what's going on inside the lagoon. Um, and often multiple sampling ports that can be used for sludge extraction as well. And you can see in this general um, arrangement here, um, it, the, these H arrays here, these are the ballasting lines for stormwater management. Gas can exit to the periphery and that, that's assisted by these walkways, providing gas paths uh, to the periphery. Um, cover materials um, uh, more, more interesting than the lining materials, I suppose. So, what the cover has to I, I cover address three particular challenges: the same chemical resistance issues, or even worse um, than the than the liner. There's more there's more um, cover exposed to gas. You can get elevated temperatures because the cover is exposed to sunlight and it gets hotter. Um, and, you, and you get more um, concentrated pockets of um, acid gas with the cover. So chemical resistance is, uh, is, is really, really important. Uh, unlike the line of the covers now exposed to UV loaders, it must have good UV um, properties. And thirdly, um, the cover needs good mechanical properties, mechanical strength, um, tensile strength and punch performance and so forth, but also flexing uh, and fatigue. Um, which is, which is in some respects in conflict with the chemical resistance. So the, the materials mostly used are polyethylene propylene or EIA CSPE. The most uh, common choice is the polyethylene, really good um, chemical resistance, pretty good UV performance, um, but does, uh, isn't good at flexing uh, and fatigue. And so needs really careful um, design to minimize the amount of flexing and fatigue to uh, provide a durable cover solution. It's the opposite to, um, to polypropylene, um, which has um, really good flexing performance. Um, UV not, too, uh, not, not as good, um, uh, but chemical resistance can be its Achilles heel. Uh, and the life of polypropylene uh, covers is usually a fair bit less. EIA and CSP, good choices, um, uh, often a very suitable choice, but um, uh, significant cost penalty. Given the need to de sludge periodically, um, uh, often, and when you're de sludging a large um, uh, facility, it's not possible to um, reuse the cover. So, um, really long lifetimes are not usually being required by clients, and therefore, a polyethylene cover uh, can provide satisfactory life. Um, here's, a, here's a good example of um, construction. So this is halfway through. Um, this is a smallish 
um, Anaerobic Lagoon. It's a new build. Um, it's for an abattoir. You can see several interesting features here. Uh, I hope you can see them on the small screen. <coughs> so the line, the lining system um, is already installed here and um, is, in, is into its own anchor trench. A separate anchor trench uh, is just behind that for the cover. So two anchor trenches in this case. You can see there's a gas ring placed on top of the, um, the lining system. That's the ring main for the gas system. Uh, HDP liner, HDPE cover. The cover's been prefabricated behind the lagoon. You can't factory prefabricate HDP materials. Just prefabricated on site. Uh, in a way that avoids creasing and damage, and then has to be a um, float system across the front of the um, uh, the cover and um, and pulled across the lagoon. <coughs> this is an example where you need to design for the properties of um, uh, HDPE. You, ca you can't have deep troughs, as is often the case in, for example, potable water flooded cover systems. So you need to uh, you need to be installing the flowing cover at the water operating level that will, will be there in service. These, these systems pretty much are always have a pretty static water level, it doesn't change in height very much at all. And you install them at install the covers at that um, um, uh, at that water height so to minimize any um, trough size and therefore flexing and uh, risking damage to the polyurethane geomembrane. Um, so construction of a liner is pretty, um, pretty conventional, uh, bottom right, uh, uh, normal lining system, um, installation. You can see here, uh, just a regular earthen basin, uh, in, in this case here, there's some pipe penetrations that need careful design for those slurred withdrawal pipes. Uh, but the covers are again, much more complicated. It's a wet installation, not a dry installation. <clears throat> for a new build, um, there's, um, there's no gas issues to worry about, such as the previous slide. Um, this top left slide here is a new build, quite a much larger lagoon. It's a new build, but needed refurbishment of uh, some of the lining um, system features. So the lagoon was emptied, it was desludged, it was um, uh, integrity surveyed to make sure there's no damage from the desludging, or if there was, it was repaired. Um, and then fill with water. So while it's an existing facility, it's not, actually not a gas producing facility. Where's the, um, on the bottom left, you can see, this is an active lagoon. It's a large, large lagoon. It's not possible to deploy on the, on the uh, bank and deploy over the lagoon. You have to build it on the water. So here's a large um, engineered and marine certified uh, flood and work platform being installed with a crane to create that work platform. And all, all the work on, on this project um, requires special care and attention around uh, ignition points. Uh, obviously methane in the right concentrations is explosive. Um, and then to look at um, some, some examples. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is a large uh, floating cover for um, Golden Valley water. They call it a high rate anaerobic lagoon. It, um, it, it um, it's a re was a refurbishment project. This is the new cover having been installed. Uh, it takes um, wastewater from the Shepparton area. Um, uh, the majority of the wastewater is actually industrial uh, effluent from a couple of large uh, factories in the area. Uh, it's equivalent to uh, a population of around 1.1 million um, people. You can see in the um, in the top right picture, uh, that's the original um, asset some years ago, <coughs> when it was uh, still performing satisfactorily. Um, polypropylene material uh, eventually um, succumbed to the challenges that it was um, UV and uh, chemical attack, and it, and eventually um, mechanically failed, and hence the need for replacement. Large, so it's about 50,000 square meters. There aren't very many covers, uh, gas covers of that size in the world. Um, and you can see in the, in the picture below, while this is actually um, with the cover being removed, this large area at the back here, this is where the cover had actually failed. Um, 
and the uh, this section here is now where cover's been removed in, in the process of being removed and this area here where cover's been removed and you can also see obviously clearly all this gum and sludge um, that's accumulated during the life the uh, asset would be about 16 years old <coughs> so the scope of the project was um to remove and dispose of the existing cover. So you can see here, um, there's a lot of mass. So uh, th these products are around about a kilo per square meter, a bit more. And so there's a lot of, um, you know, it's 50, 60 tons of material to be removed. You can't do that manually in these plant to do that. The material's contaminated. You can see <clears throat> here that there's somebody's washing as the material comes off. The material is being washed to clean it. There's a particular defined area uh, that's receiving contaminated runoff from this uh, that needs to be controlled. Um, and then the material uh, has to be taken in a certified uh, truck um, to a certified landfill um, qualified to receive such materials. So uh, quite an effort just in removing the cover in the first instance. Um, <clears throat> Um, the concrete, um, the, the, the third of infrastructure on the project. So here, top right, you can see there's a um, concrete beam. Um, surveys were done to examine um, the condition of the beam and the beam was um, before the, the project was, uh, the cover was removed and the beam was quite badly damaged. In some areas, it was possible to remediate the beam. In other areas, it was necessary to um, uh, put a new beam in place. So in this case here, we're casting a new beam in, in place um, while the um, while the existing cover's on. We wanted to minimize the cover off time uh, for odor emissions for the neighbor's benefit. So I had to remediate all the concrete and bring the entire periphery one day, either by uh, refurbishment or new beam. <clears throat> and then sludge removal. So there's a huge quantity um, of sludge in the Bottom middle picture here, you can see you can see the um, equipment being used to uh, desludge, and and <clears throat> on the left hand side here we've got the uh, drying beds where the sludge was pumped to, um, and that uh, then is will uh, result in uh, rich fertilizer um, that can be um, um, beneficially used. Um, Concern um, from the owner because of the life of the previous asset. So we um, quite an extensive uh, assessment of material options, not just uh, in terms of would it be HDP or a different material, but also which particular formulation of HDP. Undertook some quite extensive testing of the material, elevated temperatures in um, liquor extracted from the pond with additional uh, aggressive. Uh, elements added to it <coughs> and uh, and we're able to demonstrate that we've picked the right um from desktop study the right material that will provide durability in this application um and um and as you can see here this is the, the example i gave earlier where uh, we have to have a large uh, work bottom right here a large work platform floating in the water um to to uh, build the um build the cover the, the, the pond, if you look at the top right picture here, <coughs> you can see uh, about here, about a third of the way across the cover, we're building the cover from here, across to here, about a third of the way across, <coughs> pardon me, is where that first third had the most um, gas production. And, uh, and so we had a clever feature where we could uh, actually put gas on during construction and, and we could extract gas from this first third of the cover while we we're still building the remainder remainder of the um of the floating cover <coughs> so there's there's uh, the completed cover on the, on the bottom right hand side so uh, the the client then got a refurbished facility um live of 20 years Built, built safely, um, and they're back in service now, capturing uh, biogas um, and selling to the energy partner. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Another example, a, um, a lagoon in Tamworth. Um, quite commonplace for red meat processing facilities. Their, um, uh, and their waste is of very high energy. Expanding this facility from <coughs> pardon me, 8,000 heads of cattle a day to 12,000. Uh, and going to seven day continuous working. Uh, and the whole facility we installed with two cow, pair of cows, killed and anaerobic lagoons, a sequencing battery reactor and a decamp basin finally taking the wastewater. Um, there's an example of a re really nice um, taut flat cover, uh, very little, um, uh, the troughs quite small, operating negative pressure, fully operational. In this case, um, the client um, was happy to have a one and a half mil um, liner, a little bit less expensive than a two millimeter liner, and uh, would provide the necessary durability, but a two millimeter cover to get that extra life in the cover. <coughs> no gas storage requirements. And, uh, and then finally, well, as before I croak stop, um, stop talking, um, this is dairy waste. So we've looked at um, industrial effluent, red meat processing, and dairy waste, um, and um, um, similar similar uh, issues around uh, fat, soil, and greases. There's no pre-treatment <coughs> on what's going into the lagoon, and um, met the client requirements of um, being able to harvest the gas, avoid uh, greenhouse emissions, odors. Um, and adhere to their uh, EPA licenses. Um, and uh, there's, there's another uh, picture of that particular lagoon. Some references will be on the um, um, slides, and um, I'm pleased to say I'll take questions and I can stop talking. Okay. Thank you, Graham. It's, uh, it's a really interesting application for geomembranes that still has its own unique challenges. Um, I have a, we do have a few questions. I've got one to start with. Um, re regarding um, the application itself, obviously storing methane in these uh, applications, is there some requirement for uh, a level of fire resistance or how, how is that handled in these sort of applications? You know, you've got uh, gas, gas storage requirements and I don't know, the potential for bushfires and embers and things. Is, it, is there some level of uh, fire resistance that comes into the, the materials that are used? Do they have to meet a certain uh, specification for that? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, the, one of the key things is there's a, um, a gas zone that needs to be um, applied. Up. It's at some meters <coughs> outside the periphery of the cover two or three meters outside, everything within that zone needs to be intrinsically safe. So right. you can't have any ignition sources of any sort whatsoever, anything electrical has to be electrically intrinsically safe and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you've got no risk of um, uh, causing a, an explosion. Yep. And there's usually regular um, gas monitoring checks annually to make sure the cover's seen properly. And you've got no leaks from the cover. Right, yep. What about other types of membranes as well? You mentioned a few, including HDP and PP. <coughs> I guess for uh, uh, the, the the gas permeability comes comes into it, doesn't it? To a degree. What about the membranes such as uh, EVOH that have obviously been shown to be yeah, exactly. low in gas permeability? Plus, they've got the the polyethylenes either side as well, which which give it give it that chemical resistance as well. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> with the positive pressure cover, that's more important. But yeah. with a negative pressure cover, which most of the earthen basins are, um, you're not going to leak gas out. You're going to suck air in. And so, with a so, uh, with a, a smaller tank, where often you've got a bubble cover that's inflated and expanding and contracting, yes, you've got a bigger issue um, with get with the pressure forcing gas through the membrane. But generally, the gas flows are pretty minimal and um, you know pretty much negligible. Yeah, not an important consideration. Okay. Uh, another question we've got from uh, from the attendees is: Should there be a gas extraction system under the liner, so under the uh, the uh, lining system itself, to present formation of whales or any associated stresses in the liner? Is usually, so the, uh, <clears throat> the actual suction points away from the um, 
the cover um, so that you got any ignition source away from the cover, you're just presenting to the cover the vacuum, the port with a, with a vacuum. I think the, I think the question relates to under the, the, the cell itself rather than the cover. Yeah, and, and then usually we've got um, gas deliberately defined gas paths within within the cover to allow the gas to get out. So it generally accumulates under the cover. Yeah. The gas path that will direct it out to the periphery and then it can escape along the gas ring main exit port. And um, we've got one more question and that, that's regarding the expected design life of a cover layer. So should owners allow for these to be replaced from time to time? What's, what's their expected design life of these? Because obviously they're under quite extreme conditions with the UV and the, the, the chemical uh, the chemicals that they're exposed to as well. So how, how is that addressed? So if you... <coughs> pardon me. Not all polyethylenes are the same, but if you pick the right polyethylenes with good UV uh, additive packages and... Um, a general additive package is appropriate for an acid environment. 30 year life is uh, easily uh, achievable with a um, two millimetre HDP yeah. membrane, probably significantly more, but certainly 30 years would be the life expectation. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think that answers all of our questions that have been raised for today. So thank you again, Greg. Uh, thank you again, Graham, for today's mm -hmm. webinar and all our attendees. We've got one last webinar for 2021, so please join us again on December the 8th for a special webinar with Boyd Ramsey. He'll be discussing how our industry is going with geosynthetics and sustainability. You will have some interviews and discussions with special guests, so be sure to join us at 9, uh, 3 p.m. Brisbane time on December the 8th. Goodbye and hope to see everyone next time. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.